Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today I'm really delighted to be joined by a advanced surgical care practitioner called John Broughton. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much, James, and uh, thanks for inviting us along. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. I think this might be the third in a sort of series of podcast episodes I've made around different medical professionals. Sometimes we're grouped together as, uh, under the umbrella term, medical associate professions. Um, so the physician associates, the anesthesia associates, advanced critical care practitioners and the surgical care practitioners. Um, I've done episodes on the others. Um, so it's the turn of the surgical care practitioners today. So I thought it'd be really interesting to find out a little bit more about SCPs and um, how they are similar to physician associates, how they might be different, how we work together um, and just get to the bottom really of, of different members of the team. Yeah, that uh, sounds really good. And, uh, glad, glad to be here to have that discussion with you. So I've been a physician associate, I think I've been qualified for four years, maybe a bit more now. And I still get asked usually once a week by somebody, a patient or another colleague, what is a physician associate? I'm not convinced I've yet cracked a really good way of explaining what a PA is. Is that something that you get asked a lot as a surgical care practitioner? Do you get asked what your role is quite frequently? Yeah, that's, very, that's a very good question. And um, we do get that asked a lot. And, and because we work very closely with doctors, as you can imagine, um, patients often assume that, that, that we are doctors ourselves. Um, and so we often have that conversation. And I think the way I tend to explain it more often than not is, is you know, patients are more familiar now with, with maybe what a nurse practitioner is, certainly in the GP surgery. That's something that, that patients can relate to. And often patients will come in and say, I couldn't get to see my GP, but I saw the nurse practitioner and, and they were really good or, or, or whatever it may be. And so often I do say, hi, I'm John. I'm a surgical care practitioner. Um, I'm working you know, in neurology. Um, I'm one of the, 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 the surgical practitioners, perhaps. But I often compare it and say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a nurse practitioner, but in surgery. And, and that kind of often then, you know, means something to the, to the patient. Having said that, at the end of the uh, consultation or discussion, they will often say, thank you very much, doctor, <laughs> as you walk away. So, um, but it is, yeah, it is a nice context. <laughs> <laughs> so is it fair to say that most surgical care practitioners were nurses originally who have done a master's degree to become a surgical care practitioner in much the same way as the advanced nurse practitioners on the medical side of things? Yeah, I think I think that would be um, a reasonable assumption. I think most surgical care practitioners are either nurses or, or operate, operating department practitioners um, who are essentially um, you know, qualified professionals who, who mainly are limited to working in the, in the theatre environment and a bit like there was another episode of, of your wonderful podcast that I'd listened to um, uh, not that long ago um, in preparation for this and um, again in surgical care practitioner world generally you apply for a, a, a job um, as a trainee surgical care practitioner um, I think it was the um, anesthesia um, associate um, episode that I was listening to and they said the very the same thing it's not you don't really go directly into the the SCP course you know applying from something else like you may would maybe would for a, a physician's associate but again it's normally a job that you apply for that's been funded by a, an NHS organization because they've recognized the gap in the workforce um, and so often it is a is a, is a nurse or an ODP however when we've advertised for positions before within our team we have widened that and opened it to, to physiotherapists um, I've had paramedics apply in. Uh, I do even know of a social worker who ended up being a, a, an SCP in one trust. Um, so, it, so it can work. Um, I think the things that, that probably limit it a little bit as well is, is probably similar issues to yourselves in terms of there are only certain groups of people that have independent prescribing, which can be useful in some other roles as well. So, cool. Okay. Yeah, it was going to be one of my questions. I might ask you in a minute about prescribing. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about yourself to start with? Do you want to tell us about your background and how you got into being a surgical care practitioner? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a qualified nurse um, by background. I qualified in, in 2005 um, from, from Teesside University. 
um, with an advanced diploma, as it was at the time. Um, the, uh, and I first of all started to work in accident and emergency at uh, James Cook Hospital. And that, that was the area that really kind of fascinated me when I was a, a student. Um, really interested me and, and so I did a few years working in, in that department and at, at that time um, the, the, the advanced or the emergency care practitioners were, were just starting to become um, a, a thing that was talked about quite a lot and I was, I was very interested in going into that side of things I realised I wanted to kind of really stay clinical I think you know as a nurse you kind of take one of two paths normally you normally end up kind of going into the management route or you or you stick with the, the, the clinical and, and it was the clinical side and, the, and certainly the advanced nurse practitioner kind of um, areas that were really interesting to me um and i was just getting to the point where i started to look at what you know well, i've done about three years in uh, as, a, as, a, as a general staff next i'm starting to look at these other roles and think yeah this this is something i really want to explore and i remember i was searching for general nurse practitioner roles and I came across an advert for a trainee surgical care practitioner in cardiothoracic surgery and I remember reading the the job description and I searched it on google to say what is this what are these surgical care practitioners and and it really blew my mind with with what they were, they were you know wanting to to do with this role what they were tra potentially training us up to do and 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 that was everything from you know first assisting a consultant surgeon to perform open heart surgery so it, it was it was just you know you and them potentially um you know using a scalpel on, on a patient and, and being taught to suture um, and taught to, to harvest their uh, blood vessels for this procedure and all of this kind of stuff i thought there's no way as a nurse that you, you can you can be trained to do that it's, it's it's amazing um anyway i applied for the job um and again really didn't really think that you know, I'd, I'd have much chance um and I was really fortunate enough to be to not just get an interview, but 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 landed the job. And there was a team of three or four of us starting all at the same time. And it was it was it was you know great, really exciting, really interesting. Um, learned learned a lot, and and again, um, very daunting at times as well. It was a big big change and, and a lot to take on. Um, but we went on and did a a, a degree again at the time in at Teesside University in, in surgical care practice. And I was there for for six years doing that which again really enjoyed and, and learned a lot uh, and in that role um we did a lot more than just the theater it was, it was very much set up to, to be the whole patient journey um and, and again there was junior doctor workforce issues outside on, on the wards as well so so our, our team you know one one day we may be in theater um assisting with with surgeries and, and the next day we may be on the, on the wards covering um again what traditionally what a junior doctor would, would do um, doing war drums, um, you know, uh, seeing to patients getting getting called in when someone wasn't well, all of that kind of thing. Um, um, so, so it was very, very advanced and really enjoyed it. Um, and then I did a little bit of time in management um, for, for some reason. Um, it kind of it lured me in at the end, even though I didn't want to go in that, that, that direction. And then I ended up um, covering an area um, which is which was a, a urology um, service, which had you know huge junior doctor shortages they just couldn't get get the cover um for both in theater assisting and so there were there, were, there was often for robotic procedures which we're involved in now there was two consist two consultants performing one operation um, and also outside on the wards as well um and from my experience I, you know i'd approached the clinical director at the time and the, and the management and said what you really need is a team of surgical care practitioners and advanced clinical practitioners and, and we can deliver deliver a lot of the service for you um, and I was very fortunate again that the management took that on um, and and got the funding through and converted a lot of locum spend and different things like that into, into these um, substantive roles. Um, and now we work um, in, in a real blended kind of team. We have a few junior doctors, we have um, seven um, nurse practitioners, as I call them, but they're really advanced clinical practitioners and surgical care practitioners who, who perform a seven day service now. Um, in urology, uh, 12 hour, 12 hours a day, and provide the real, what we'll call like the base medical cover for, for the, the urology specialty that I work in now. So that's kind of my journeys to, to where I am now. Perfect, thank you. It's sparked off a question in my head around, is there a difference in that you see between a surgical care practitioner and an advanced nurse practitioner or an advanced clinical practitioner, whatever the correct term is? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and, and it's one that a lot of people don't kind of understand the, the difference between. Um, and I certainly have a view on that and I know a lot of my colleagues do as well. And the way I view it really is that, you know, the surgical care, care practitioner is, is trained to um, pr perform certain 
tasks in in the theatre, uh, and and there's a, and there's a very um, distinct skill set for that. And, there's, and um, you know, working in surgical areas and working closely in, with surgeons in that kind of environment, you know, is a totally different skill set to, to anything we do outside of, of, of that area. Um, and it, uh, the way I kind of you know think about it and explain it to people sometimes is, is very much in the same way as, as, as the medical model. So you know, there are physicians who are you know who are trained and, and their training is, is 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 ultimately regulated by the you know, the Royal College of Physicians and 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 you know um doctors ultimately in training will, will go on to be consultants in, in that area but there will be a generally like a medical consultant um and also then for for junior doctors who are wanting to train to be surgeons it's 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 a very different route and a very different training process and ultimately they they, they are um re, you know registered as as surgeons with a, with a with a national body and i do view the same really um in 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 this kind of area um and, and i think sometimes the lines get blurred a little bit um there probably are reasons for that and, and it's probably just the way things have evolved and and it, and it, it hasn't been um separated out maybe the way that it should should have been from a national point of view and um, but that's another conversation um but yeah i think i think very much that that the the, the, the the they are different um and and as i said there are it is a, spe a specialist kind of skill set um and i'm very much you know, drill it into our teams that that you know we we can you know go out and and, and have a role on, on the wards and caring for the patients on the wards a bit like the surgical registrars doing form part of that team. But but when it goes the other way, it, it really should be some some specialist training involved, you know, to be able to handle a scalpel and and and, and do the things, the kind of things that that, that we do in a theatre environment. Okay, cool. So if I've understood it correctly, it's fair to say a surgical care practitioner is more of a specialist within the theatre environment itself and has more skills to help with the actual operation and um, procedure. Um, but you can also do some of the world work looking after the patients post-op and, and that's but that doesn't make up the bulk necessarily of what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um and and that's the way you know we've designed the the, the roles and, and that and that means that we, we get some variety as well um, and, and also have to have the understanding of what happens you know before and after um some of the surgeries which is helpful i think in some areas where it's either just starting out or the fund the fund has been limited they may be, be, be less surgical care practitioners and, and they, they may do a predominantly theater role um and that's understandable as well um, but that's not the way kind of we've designed it um and the other thing that that scps can do is they sometimes will um, again with the right training and the right supervision and again supervision is an important um, element and, and or clinical supervision and I've heard that come through again a lot of the map the map roles and rightly so um, SCPs can can then go on to undertake their own minor procedure lists as well um, so this may be um, and again there's been there's been newspaper articles and documentaries done about this at various times but that may be say like a carpal tunnel list where it's again a very nice neat operation that can be taken on and, and that can be really helpful in terms of service delivery um it may be um yeah, like joint injections um you know and we in urology do a lot of flexible cystoscopy and, and um, bladder biopsy kind of procedures which which can can, can, be, can be taken on so there are areas like that which again can be can be developed and, and it's a really good area to, to develop some autonomy and independent practice so unlike physician associates who tend to be from coming in from outside of the NHS tend to be science graduates or people working in other industries and then do the masters at PA school to become a PA. Surgical care practitioners tend to be experienced NHS workers who then go further in their scope of practice. Could you say something about the scope of practices of a surgical care practitioner and I guess perhaps what the limitations might be as well? I'm assuming you're not going to get many surgical care practitioners, for example, working in general practice or other specialties. So you're absolutely right in, in that, you know, a lot of people who, who want to, to train to be surgical care practitioners are generally experienced, um, you know, NHS workers from a, either a nursing background, often a surgical or theatre nursing background or, or operating operate department practitioner. Uh, but then not always. And and um, the, the training has been um, designed to take, you know, someone from from scratch, if you like, if needs be, um, right up to being a a, a competent, um, you know, first assistant in theatre, 
the training is accredited by the Royal College of Surgeons and the definition of, of a surgical care practitioner kind of evolved in, in, in the, the late noughties or the mid to late noughties really and, and, and the Royal College of Surgeons were, were, were pivotal in that in putting out a, a, a curriculum framework and what the, what the standards should be and also accredit certain universities so there is only three universities at the moment who are, who are running approved surgical care practitioner courses and that process again is very very competency based it, it's got key key milestones and sign off by a, by a supervising consultant surgeon, um, and it, and and that's linked you know in with with the um, you know with the university's program and, and ultimately you know if, if if there are issues in practice then you, you you don't you don't qualify you know the two are hand in hand, and that's very much how nurse training works and, and also medical training as well. So so you know those of us from a healthcare background are kind of used are used to that kind of process um and and, and it, it, it's it's a good way to go and i think because of that it is you know we are very aware of our yes this is an advanced practice role and we're doing things that that our original qualification and training you know probably wouldn't afford or allow us to do um but we and but because of that extra kind of you know knowledge and responsibility we, we do take that very seriously generally um and we're always or hopefully should always be aware of our limitations as well. Um, and, and that's part of being a safe and competent practitioner. It's it's understanding what we can do, but also what 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 is beyond that scope. And that might change as well. And we recognize that. So you know when when you're first for, you know first out uh, first qualified and in your first job, there'll be certain things which you think oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I need to call for help here if, uh, and that's perfectly fine. But you know five or six years down the line that might that might be different and, and you you know, through through clinical supervision, you might have got to a, a place where you can handle, um, you know, a, a bit a bit more before you would then, um, you know, call for help. But again, it's always recognizing that, you know, we we are not doctors, we are not surgeons, we are not there to to, to ultimately take take that place. But we are part of a wider surgical team, um, and, and you know, recognizing your, your limitations is important. You mentioned that there were three university courses producing surgical care practitioners. I guess by contrast to the PA world, I think we're now up to about 35, something in that region, um, university courses, and maybe something like a thousand PAs registering every year. Do you know much about the history of the surgical care practitioner profession, when it started, how it's grown in numbers and how things have evolved? Yeah, so... I do know a bit. I've, I've obviously done a bit of reason over the um, over the years and, and talked to a few different people. Obviously, being being as young as I am, I wasn't there at the beginning. Um, but yeah, certainly. So I think I think you know probably similar as well to some of the other uh, maps. We kind of have evolved um, about twenty years behind um, America, and, and certainly, and um, when you look at the history of of this kind of thing in America, um, it's very clearly documented. You know, with sur surgeons' assistants, as they're called, uh, generally over the pond that was all kind of developing you know quite a few years years before and in terms of this country there was the first documented case that we can that we can go back to um is a lady called suzanne holmes who was who was um being trained to be again a, 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 like an assistant in assistant kind of role in theater modeled on what what was going on in, in the states if i remember rightly i think she was in involved in cardiothoracic surgery at the time and 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 that she took a trip over to america to learn how to how to to see what they were doing over there and and kind of developed the role organically in this country and again it was kind of quite pioneering at the time but but there was nothing really formal that um until until the talk really kind of generated around the european working time directive and and the really the, the limitations on junior doctor hours because um you know for those that know this um they'll they'll understand for those that don't you know the junior junior doctors and and you know med, med, medics and training really provided a, the, the entire um you know workforce really for the nhs for for a lot of service delivery um and when those those hours were starting to be talked about limited there was a lot of panic in the system because because there was no talk of masses of extra junior doctors it was just like limit them out limit their hours and then you know what's what's going to replace them and and so in the in the early 2000s um, there started to be a lot more discussion about that, and, and there was also the Kalman report on on surgical training, and and really limiting the amount of time that surgeons spent or the amount of years that surgeons spent training as well. And so there's, there was a lot of um, you know fear and anxiety that surgeons wouldn't get enough experience actually doing the procedures that they needed needed to do um, because they were doing so much healthcare delivery and 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 all of that kind of thing outside of theatre. 
And so these discussions kind of were, were happening at a national level and, and, and that's where in the early 2000s, the Royal College of Surgeons you know, was really behind formalizing this, this type of, of role. Um, and they developed the, the curriculum framework and they could see how, how this, you know, the, the expansion of this, this role and the formalization of this role was going to be able to provide um, an extra layer of, 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 of a wider surgical team. So that's really kind of how it um, has been established and formulated. Um, there's been an update to the, the curriculum framework, which came out in 2014. Um, but again, unfortunately, there hasn't been, um, you know, the, 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 the places that you can train, again, is limited. So we have to travel to, uh, to Manchester for a few hours down the road to be able to attend university, which is where we send our, our trainees currently. It's interesting you ask about numbers because that's something that, that we still don't really know how many surgical care practitioners there are. And I think that, that you know, we are working, trying, trying to work towards that. We don't have at the minute. Um, mandatory registration um, and, and I think that a lot of that is driven by the fact that a lot of us who are SCPs have a, um, a, a base profession as well whether that's you know um, a nursing qualification or an ODP qualification you know we are either regulated by the NMC um, or the HPC, HCPC so that that kind of hasn't really prompted us to drive on and, 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 and push for re registration and regulation like like for example the, the, the PAs. So it's uh, really exciting that the back end of um, 2021 we set up the Association of Surgical Care Practitioners uh, which is the first really coming together nationally of, of SCPs and we're really aiming to, to try and you know bring about um, you know voluntary registration where, where we can um, support for the SCP workforce because often SCPs may be you know loan workers or, or, or you know there may be only a few of, of the the, that role in, within the hospital, so it's, it's trying to it's trying to get some support um, for SCPs across the country. It's trying to promote the role as well, trying to um, get it out there to, to surgeons and, and surgical departments that, that don't quite understand um, it yet and, and what the benefits could be for 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 their teams and, and ultimately for their for the patients that they care for, um, and, and trying to um, provide some standardisation as well, um, because again there's there's variation in in, in what goes on what roles are, what people do, and also what, what people are paid as well. So um, so kind of that's that's where we're at, at the minute. And, and we are, you know, working closely with the Royal Colleges, both in England and in Edinburgh where possible, and and also with um, Health Education England, which is really kind of being given the task of, of, of drawing together kind of all of these, uh, the medical associate professionals. Um, I think this is something about, you know, a lot of this has, has developed organically and I'm sure you'll, you'll experience that as well. Uh, and it hasn't really kind of been been f formulated and, and, and driven from the centre, which does have some benefits, but also um, it, it does mean that, they're, they're, that things get get left and, and sometimes not not planned in the way that they could be. Um, but, but, you know, we are getting there and we're, we're in a lot better position now than, than what we were a few years ago. And that's where these kind of discussions with, with um, you know, similar colleagues who are, who are all doing the same type of roles is really good. And I think, you know, working together with Health Education England, I'm really optimistic over the ne in the next few years that, um, you know, uh, that there'll be a lot more structure um, and there'll be a lot, there'll be a lot more kind of organisation in, 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 in how these roles are, are, are set up and, and um, how workforce planning is done in the future. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion about regulation, isn't it? I know when the GMC consultation was out a few years ago and they were asking for opinions on which of the medical associate professions should, if any, be regulated. And it was only the PAs and the AAs that the GMC are taking on currently. I guess they felt that the ACCPs and the SCPs were likely already regulated by your professional bodies, the NMC, the HCPC, as you mentioned. I wonder if in the future things might change. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting um, topic, and um, it's one I, I we, we we debate as the association a little bit as well because there are certainly clear benefits to it, um, but also there's some grey areas as well. Um, and and for for those of us who are you know, qualified nurses, we we think well, what what would happen to our nursing registration? Would we have to give that up? You know, would we be dual registered? And then what, what happens if I was doing a shift one day as a nurse? Well, who am I registered under? Or, or if something were to happen, 
you know, who would take me to task on it if I was dual? But, you know, there's, there's there's a lot of questions that I think need to be thrashed, thrashed out. Um, yes, but are you right, that's... As PAs, we won't have that necessarily. I suppose there might be a few PAs who were, were nurses in the past, but most don't hold registration already. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, so it's a little bit more um, straightforward, and I think that's why they made that decision in the end. It was, it was, it was the the, the simpler, simpler things to go out to start with. And we'll, we'll, we'll leave the other things down the line. Most advanced clinical practitioners or advanced nurse practitioners, I still can't quite get my head around the titles. Most of those uh, colleagues are prescribers. Uh, forgive my ignorance, I usually only work in medical settings, GP land and the acute medical unit. Is there much need for surgical care practitioners to be prescribers? Are you all prescribers? How does it work if you're not? Um, are there issues? Yeah, that's, that's again a really good question. Um, so at, at this point in time, um, prescribing is not a mandatory part of the of the SCP training. Uh, it's not part of the, the, the master's course. Although, if again, if you were doing an advanced clinical practitioner um, course, which some of my team are, um, it, it is a mandatory part of that of that program of course. Um, so for SCPs, it's not mandatory. And, and again, probably one of the reasons why it hasn't been mandatory so far is again, you know, would, it, would you wouldn't want to limit um, like ODPs who again are regulated by the HCPC. Um, who, who can't currently become independently prescribers, um, so that would that would you know limit their access to the training, which which you know wouldn't really be fair. So, um, um, so it's not mandatory. Um, although I, you know, I personally strongly encourage it. Um, all of our team of SCPs, um, and there's a team of four of us in neurology, um, and it's very similar in cardiothoracic surgery as well, where I worked. We were all prescribers because of our our extended role on the wards as well. Um, and, and very much um, that was part of our role and, and what we, what, you know, we needed to needed to make it um, f- function as, as well as possible uh, for patient care. So it's it's not mandatory. Um, it is different in different areas. Um, I, I think I think it is really useful, and I, I would encourage it, you know anyone of my colleagues to to, to do it if possible. Um, and and I really would love to make some progress, you know, with with um, getting you know the same the same as as, as with you guys. You know, getting getting ODPs to be um, eligible to be independent prescribers because I think that'll that'll certainly really make the difference. Um, as as you probably agree, I presume. Fascinating, really. We get so kept up in our little PA world sometimes in a little bubble of thinking we're the only ones with uh, professional problems and and these quirks. And then you, if you stop and think and talk to colleagues in other worlds, it's yeah other nuances and other problems that we don't face but are, are similar in or different to yeah. others absolutely one of the other questions i wanted to ask was around um pay so i'm assuming you're on the agenda for change contract as well how yeah. does so physician associates tend to be banded at band seven most advanced yeah. clinical practitioners i'm aware of tend to be in band eight a where do surgical care practitioners fall yeah, again, so it's a good question. And again, there's a lot of variability nationally. Uh, that's kind of the, the stock answer at the minute to everything. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly. So so nurse, uh, surgical care practitioners across the country are anything from band sixes, I do come across and hear about, and, and certainly in training, often that's what that's what is sometimes used. Um, in our department, we've um, used the Annex 21 of a band seven for training. So it's kind of like a, a training wage just below and the, the bottom of a band seven and while people are training and then on qualification, it's generally a, a band seven. And I think band seven is probably the most commonest nationally from just anecdotally from the discussions I have. Um, there are SCPs who are band eight, but again, that's very much kind of department by department. Um, and, and again, we, we are having those discussions within, within our trust as well. And there is a, a few of us within our department who are fortunate enough to be bandits. And again, mainly that's because we do independent um, like, like diagnostic uh, clinic lists ourselves. Um, and so that 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 um, is, is very similar to what a nurse endoscopist is. And, and so we, we kind of um, um, have, have had that. Now, and it's interesting that you say that, that advanced clinical practitioners are generally uh, band eight because we we have some in our team um, and we're just going through the process a minute and um, to try and move them from a band seven to a band eight because again 
there is guidance about that, but it's, it hasn't been adopted nationally um, as yet. And I think, I think again, this is another area which I think really is changing and, and needs to change nationally. Uh, and again, I compare it to, to kind of, you know, nursing in a lot of ways, you know, we generally know within the country that if, you, if you're a staff nurse, around the country that is generally recognized as a, as a, as a bag five role equally a clinical sister as a as a, as a six and and yet uh, and it'll be the same in the medical world but yet but yet with these advanced practice roles that again have organically evolved there still really isn't anything set in stone that that this is the career progression and this is the the level that 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 people should be paid at and it creates a lot of probably animosity and discussion and lots of different things so again that's that's really something that that i think we need to we need to to get right and it's helpful for for progression and and for career um uh you know, career structure and 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 things like that as well so so yeah that's definitely something that that you know, we are working on and and um we're having really productive discussions with that with our, our trust and our, our trust is really really taking big strides this year in terms of developing a, an advanced practice um, strategy um, and, and so it's a, so it's a really exciting time um, at the moment. Leads me in nicely to the last question I was going to ask, uh, which is around, I guess, one of the big stumbling blocks for a lot of physician associates, maybe the students in particular, is seeing career progression um, for us as a profession. There isn't anything set in stone about how you progress from a newly qualified PA through your career. I see that as an excellent opportunity and a, for a bit of blue sky thinking and it's allowed me to work across GP land and hospital and, and do lots of mm. things and um, that I can get stuck into. Some people I know of my colleagues are very keen that there needs to be a very sort of prescribed I want to take this exam, I want to prove my competency, I want to go up and up in my speciality. Is there career progression for surgical care practitioners? Is it quite loosely defined as it is in the PA world? How does it work? Yeah, I think it's very similar. Um, I, I think I think in certain areas, um, it, it, it's more well defined, but it's probably just generally done on, on a personal level. If you get good support from your from your local trusts and your surgeons that you work with, then then you know career progression can be achieved. But it's but it's you have to kind of carve it out yourself if you like. Whereas it, there's there's not a um, a, a real structure. Um, in place to be able to to offer that real pro progression, and, and certainly that's something that that you know I'm thinking about and working through and and, and trying to think through not just from, from myself but but how again how do we do this do, do this better and how do we do this on a more national level, um, and I think that's this is where you know for all of us you know the strength in coming together like just having these discussions now are really helpful because as you've as you've alluded to we all kind of have our our, our discussions and, and struggles and and think oh this is only happening to us or these are the struggles that we've got as SCPs and you know it, ACPs may be doing the same and AAs and, and certainly yourselves but but actually you know it would it is important to recognize that that we're all kind of going through these struggles we're all kind of like trying to find our way and 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 work out you know what good looks like and 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 you know what is the future and and, and how's it all gonna um, how's it all gonna come together? I do really think there is you know st strength in us coming together to do that, and, and I'm I'm really excited about the discussions we're having as a, a, a as a as a national group of um, um, of SCPs, and, and and we're you know we're encouraging as many SCPs to join as as possible because again the strength in numbers is even better, and I think across the groups you know. We should be looking to see well what what does that what does that mean for each other and, and how can we support each other um to, to achieve all of these things um and and you know not, not no one group is the answer um we, we all we all are, are part of the answer in, in a different in a different way i'm really hopeful that that health education england um will continue to to, to progress things forward and and um you know work work with us all to try and achieve something which um, not just delivers continuity of care and, and, and really fantastic care for, for patients, but but also you know develops something for the, for the workforce as well and, and develops that career progression. Um, it is possible to um, kind of develop into like what we call like a, I'd call a consultant practitioner role, where you really at, are at a very advanced autonomous level, um, and and that's certainly set out in some in some of the the, the national strategy. Um, documents, although it's labelled under advanced 
clinical practice, which is a broader term uh, in, in my view, and I think covers probably a lot of what what our roles both do as well. Um, and I think it's it sometimes gets misassociated just with what we would call ACPs. I think other advanced clinical practice is, is, a, is a wider role. And there is talk about that kind of progression and also that, that kind of consultant practitioner. Um, and, and so I, th I think, again, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I, I think that the, there will be um, career progression, um, but it's not just it's just not quite as embedded and defined as what it should be yet. Brilliant. Thanks for explaining that, John. I wondered if you could just say a little bit about uh, whether you've worked with physician associates in your career and how you've come across as an SCP and a, uh, and a PA. Yeah, certainly. So um, uh, I have come across both qualified um, physicians associates. Um, on, on one of the wards I go to, I, I do I visit a, um, uh, a, a, a smaller tr trust um, where, where we do some, some work as well. Um, and there are physicians associates who are working on, on the ward there who've come across who are, who are part of the, the, the medical team. Um, and again, extremely professional. Um, and again, uh, to start with that, I, I, I just assumed that they were um, part of the junior doctor workforce. Um, it, was, it was later down the line that I suddenly realised that I was um, I was um, dealing with the physicians associates. And, and, and again, that's a testament to just the, the, the fantastic work they were doing. Um, and also, um, as in our department, we, have, we were approached to see if we could host some, some students. Um, and we were more than happy to do so. Um, so last year, we had a few students who joined us and, and did some, and we set up a timetable for them to, to visit various areas and um, uh, see, see what, what we did on, on, obviously, on the wards, caring for the urology patients pre and post-op or as an emergency. Uh, on war drums and various things and also some uh, exposure to theatre and some of the uh, robotic surgeries and operations that we do that are, um, are interesting to see so yeah very good very keen very knowledgeable really you know wanted to learn and develop so i was had, had uh, very good uh, experiences so far part of me wonders or worries i suppose is a good word how big the pa profession could get and whether that might crowd out the other advanced practice roles and the the other maps i hope it doesn't and um, i hope the pa profession continues to be a point of entry for people outside of the nhs to come and work in but i hope that the advanced yeah. practice roles such as surgical care practitioners and, and the others are still in existence for people who are already in the nhs as other professionals who want to extend their scope of their practice i don't foresee competition or anything like that but I suppose it's worth considering about in the future. Yeah, oh, that, yeah. You, I mean, you raise a very good point there, and I think something I've been made aware of, probably again, listening to your podcast, is how many PAs there are out there and, and how many training facilities there are. And, and I think that's 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 a good thing. It's a positive thing. Um, um, but I think I think that probably goes back to, you know. The, the, the key to, to kind of working together and, and, and people understanding what the various roles are, what's important and, and, and how how different um, uh, kind of skill sets can all complement to, to deliver um, obviously the care for the patients. Um, one, one interesting thing that I do think about sometimes um, is obviously, again, what you're saying there is how, how far can these roles go? And that's what something which is, which is exciting, but also um, scary as well. And I've, I think I've mentioned already that, you know, SCPs can be can be safely taught to take on you know minor procedure lists, um, but but the, you know there is kind of always the question of well, what 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 else you know could we do in a, in, a, in a safe way and and you know will there be scope in the future to continue to develop that and take on you know slightly more um, advanced procedures or um, uh, slightly you know a, a bigger independent procedures general anesthetic cases and and things like that which might sound scary but again if they're done in the right way history teaches us that that, that is entirely possible um and, and so, so so there's a lot to kind of you know work through and, and and it's a very exciting time uh for all of us i think the one thing i'm learning the more i talk to other pas and other professions doctors surgical care practitioners and of all sorts of varieties nothing ever stays the same in the nhs we can yeah. define what a PA is perhaps at this moment in time and what a surgical care practitioner does at this point in time, but it won't be the same in 10, 20 years. The professions yeah. will move on. There'll probably be a new profession coming through, uh, the new <laughs> kid on the block that we'll all be supporting, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it, 
and it varies across the trust even doesn't it and across the hospitals and, and across the country things are very different uh, in the way that the workforce is utilized so yeah i think one thing's for sure is is we probably don't know where it's going to go <laughs> in the future yeah absolutely John, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast uh, it's been really fascinating to to find out more about scbs if people have questions thoughts comments ideas um, about surgical care practitioners where would you point them to go to find out more about the profession yeah certainly so um obviously the first um, thing i'd uh, point people to would be the uh, the association of surgical care practitioners um website uh, which can just be found by a quick google search um uh, obviously there is the information on the royal college of surgeons website as well uh, both in England and in Edinburgh. Uh, it's a very uh, useful area to, to look at. Of, and there are the individual uh, universities who provide the training as well. So anyone who's interested in looking at what, what the uh, training criteria um, are, then, then I'd have definitely appoint them to, to that area. Um, any of us will be happy to be contacted as well. Um, the Association of SCPs is, is active on social media, both on Facebook and Twitter. Is a good place to, to find out more. Um, and we'll be happy to respond to that. Perfect. Thanks, John. And I'll leave links to the things that you've spoken about and the Association of Surgical Care Practitioners and their Twitter handles on the episode notes so people can find the links to what we've been talking about in the show notes below. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been really interesting to have a discussion with you. And thanks to you for listening as well. I hope you found it interesting to find out more about surgical care practitioners and some of the similarities between SCPs and physician associates and how some of the professions are different. If you've got any questions, please get in touch with the Association of Surgical Care Practitioners. Like I say, I'll leave their contact details in the notes below. And if you're a physician associate working in the UK or across the world, if you've got a really interesting job as a physician associate um, in an unusual specialty, or any ideas for future episodes of the Physician Associate Podcast, please get in touch with me. I'm on social media at PA Podcast UK. It'd be great to hear from you and get you on a future episode of the PA Podcast. That's all for now, and I hope you'll join me again in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Physician Associate Podcast.